faculty of the mathematics department, uh, which is sponsoring this. We, we want to thank our math department staff, uh, especially Joanne, for helping. So we have the help from the Yale Office of New Haven and State Affairs, um, from the Yale Undergraduate Math Society, who are helping out with the tables out front, um, and from the uh, co-op high school video group. So we're grateful to all of those. And uh, we have some funding from the NSF, so we're always grateful for, uh, for that. Um, let me also mention, our. this is our second talk. Our third talk will be December 2nd. The speaker is Alex Kontorovich from our, our, our own department. Uh, his talk is going to be about number theory. He's going to talk about prime numbers and the Riemann hypothesis and the saxophone, so, uh, which, which he plays very well. So come for that. Um, and we're going to have, uh, after this talk, there will be two things. There will be our, our usual prize drawing for people who filled out their little cards. So if you did, we'll draw a card at random and you'll get um, a valuable gift. Um, and then we'll have a workshop. So George Hart, our speaker today, is going to tell you about all this stuff. And he's going to do, lead a workshop at the end, which takes an extra um, 30 to 60 minutes. So, if you, so we hope you'll have time to stay for that. And you can end up building your own object. Um, uh, so that's it for, for announcement. Let me tell you about our speaker. So George Hart, our speaker we're very pleased to have today, is from Stony Brook. He's a mathematician, a computer scientist, a sculptor, and an educator. Um, he's done many things. He's, he, he's built and exhibited many geometric sculptures. You saw some of the smaller things out front. Uh, he's led various innovative workshops. He's written books about geometry and about the uses of mathematics and engineering. He's taught at various universities. Um, and I think most of all, he knows, how to, he knows how to really have fun with patterns and how to think about um, you know, using patterns to understand the world better. And that's really what mathematics is about. So uh, without further ado, here's George Hart. Thank you. OK, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm a mathematician and sculptor. I like to make cool math things. I like to. I enjoy math so much, I'd like to show other people how fun and exciting math is. You may not see as much of, of math as I've seen in my life, so I try and take parts of math that I think are cool and explain to you why they're cool uh, in a visual, sculptural kind of form. So some of you saw I had outside on the table a bunch of little models. I brought them all in here so I can point them out. Uh, you're welcome to come up to the end and, and look at these and pick them up. Uh, I'll mention some of them. They all have a kind of a geometric story. Uh, these are all made by a computer, I'll talk about that in a minute, uh, but they all start like what you see on the screen. I design something in my head, I think of some mathematical idea, I figure out a way to represent it on the computer, and then I send it from the computer to a machine that actually builds it and makes it uh, real. Uh, but I'll show you a whole, a whole bunch of different uh, things here. So let's see what I can do. Good, okay. So, I start with mathematical ideas and I transform them first into a computer and then into a sculpture. And I'll show you an assortment of things here. Uh, let me ask first, is the light okay so people can see? We don't have to lower the room lights? Yes? Everyone's happy? Good, okay. Um, so, uh, this is a sculpture made out of CDs. It's about that big. Uh, and it has a mathematical pattern to it. Does anyone recognize the shape? Can you tell me? What's the underlying mathematical idea? Yes. They're all circles. There's a bunch of circles. Yeah, the circles are the CDs. And how are they put together? Are they in a line? Are they yeah. You see hexagons. OK. So uh, do I have a pointer? I don't have a pointer. I make a point with this. Um, so for example, here might be a hexagon. Is that what you mean by hexagon? Yeah. And but what's this? Pentagon. So there's some hexagons, some pentagons. Do we recognize the shape? Have we ever seen it before? Soccer ball. Yeah, it's sort of the same shape as a soccer ball. And the soccer ball, the pentagons, the five-sided ones, would be black. And the hexagons, the six-sided ones, would be white. Um, long before people invented soccer, they knew this shape. This shape is uh, well over 2,000 years old. It's called a truncated icosahedron, if you're a mathematician. Um, it was discovered about 20 years ago that it shows up in nature. So it's actually more than 2,000 years old. It's millions and billions of years old. Um, the carbon, if you take carbon atoms, and if you have a candle in the fire, there's carbon that the atoms get loose in the flame, and then they come together. They tend to naturally make this shape. 
Um, there's something called a buckyball, if you've ever heard of that. Anyone heard of a buckyball? Yeah, so this is a form of carbon, like carbon has graphite, it has diamond, and has like coal. And carbon can also make this shape where each of it, the pink things you see, uh, the pink sides of the CDs would be where a carbon atom is. And anyway, it's examples of how geometry shows up uh, in chemistry and in many other fields. Uh, I like to take mathematics and apply it to sculpture, to art and design. So you're probably familiar with how mathematics is used in science and engineering and accounting and many, many different fields. Um, but you can add to that list of fields art and design. People who are doing art are doing things with patterns and structures uh, as much as you're doing uh, mathematics in any other field. Uh, so I'll just show you a bunch of sculptures. Um, and there's also the question of how do you hold these together and how do you glue them? and the sort of engineering questions of how do you make these sculptures. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of those things, but mostly I'll talk about some of the math. So uh, this is basically a truncated icosahedron uh, to a mathematician. Uh, so this is a larger sculpture made of CDs. Um, what shapes do you see here? Yes, what do you see? You see squares. Well, maybe the angle is a little bit off. It's not exactly squares, but there are four-sided shapes there. And you may be able to see some kite shapes. And uh, this is a, let's see, is that mouse showing up there? Yeah, so from there to here to here, this is an example of a kite shape. Um, and there's a bunch of other kite shapes. So for example, here is one. Uh, and there are also triangles. Here's an equilateral triangle, three equal sides. And it turns out this whole sphere, it's about two meters in diameter, uh, is made of kite shapes and equilateral triangles. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a commission for the computer science building at uh, UC Berkeley, a university in California, and they had a big space. And I designed the sculpture uh, here in New York, and I figured out the lengths and the angles of all the slots, and I cut CDs with the slots in them. I shipped that whole sculpture in a box that was less than a one-foot cube, and it's just the CDs over there, and then I went and I assembled it. It took me about two days to put it together and it's hanging way up high in the atrium. I had to go up in the lift, and uh, it was kind of a fun project. Uh, but part of what led me to choose the shape, why I was interested in it, is because it is made of kites and triangles, and I had never seen the shape before. It's a shape that I discovered and I thought was kind of cool. And what's really cool uh, is that the kite shapes have three angles that are equal. Um, so if you look at the kite, um, this this angle here at the top of the kite, if this is the bottom of the kite, this is one kite, that's where the tail will be connected. This angle here, and this angle here, and this angle here are equal. So it has three equal angles and one angle that's different. And it has mirror symmetry, the left and the right are the same. And I thought that was kind of strange, that that's, that's too many constraints that all that could be true at once. And I was sort of surprised and happy to find the shape. And I wanted to somehow let other people know about the shape. So one thing you could do is you could write a mathematical paper that says, I discovered the shape and it has these interesting trilateral uh, heights. Or you could just make a sculpture and show people that they can sort of see for themselves and think about it. So I, I chose to make a sculpture about it. Uh, so again, each of my sculptures has some interesting little story that's interesting to me. And I try and bring it out. And then when viewers see the sculpture, I hope they get curious. They start thinking, hmm, what's the pattern there? What are those lengths and angles? Whatever. And it leads you to think about mathematics and to realize that mathematics uh, it's a very rich and fun subject. Okay, so what do we have here? Uh, we have a bunch of pencils. You could probably guess how many. There are 72 pencils. Uh, so what's happening is, uh, if you look at any one color, you might see a hexagon, six-sided tube. And in fact, there's four different hexagons in these four different colors. And uh, they all pass through the center. Uh, so that means in the center, there's a room, there's a space that's where, in which the walls are those pencils. And if you were a little mouse or something, you could live inside that room. And what shape room would that be? What kind of room has walls that are shaped so that if the sunlight was exactly along the pencil beams, the shadow of your room would be a hexagon in four different directions. So if you imagine the sun lining up with the pencils, uh, they, they, they're outlining the, the space inside. And the space inside happens to be a shape called the rhombic dodecahedron. It's not a shape you're probably familiar with. Um, but it's a shape I like. It's a very important shape uh, in crystallography, for example. Lots of little crystals that you see the atoms line up according to that shape. It has some wonderful properties. Uh, but one of its properties is it has four different hexagon shadows. Uh, so I wanted to make a little sculpture that somehow expresses that idea and fooled around a lot and ended up with this. 
Uh, this particular version of the sculpture, I've made 25 different ones with different pencils, so they're all unique, yet they all have the same uh, geometry. The, the jig I use for holding everything in place when I glue it uh, can be the same 25 times. For this one, I chose pencils uh, that are cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. Uh, that CMYK set of colors are used by printers to print things. So if you look, uh, printing pictures in magazines and books use those four colors. So I chose pencils of those four colors. And by choosing the proportions, more of one and more of the other, you can blend together practically any color that you can imagine, any color you've ever seen in a book, which comes from one of these four colors. So depending on where you stand, or as you turn the sculpture, you'll see more of one or more of the other. So you're sort of also dialing around different positions, different concentrations of colors. Uh, if you look at it from a distance, it could be uh, more of one and more of the other. Uh, this is a sculpture like a uh, mosaic, a traditional mosaic where you take squares and you glue them. Um, anyone want to guess how many pieces there are? What do you think? Shout a number. 300? 500? 700, yeah. It turns out there's 902, okay? So to work it out, it took a lot of uh, mathematical ideas to come up with this. And there's a lot more pieces than you think. A lot of work it took me about a month to make this. I first had to make a sphere, and then I had to locate points on the sphere. So perhaps you've done drawing with a compass and a straight edge where you can create an equilateral triangle or other things. If you've done a geometry class where you work with a compass, uh, what you're doing with the compass is you're locating points on a plane that are the corners of some shape you're interested in making it say a square. You have to figure out how to make an exact square. I had to work out techniques to locate the core points on a sphere with a set of points that I wanted to make. So there's some interesting mathematical challenges, technical challenges for me behind the scenes that, that I sort of enjoy struggling against. How do I take my idea and end up making it to a real sculpture? Then I had to cut out these 902 pieces at just the right shape and glue them in, etc. Um, and I, I like to look at the roads. You can sort of see your eye can kind of follow the yellow brick roads from one spot to another and, and find all the different paths in that sculpture. Uh, this is a larger metal sculpture. Uh, this is about five feet in diameter and uh, about eight feet tall. Um, and here I'm interested in the color patterns. Uh, there's a branch of mathematics called combinatorics that looks at how things combine and counts how many different that there are. Um, what you'll see if you count here, there are exactly five colors. You'll see that each of those loops crosses four other colors, and you'll notice that they're always crossing the other four colors. So the yellow one crosses you know, green, orange, red, and blue. Uh, the ends of the loops always come together in groups of three of the same color. So wherever you see the end of one loop, you'll find three loops of that same color. Um, and if you look around the five-sided openings, you'll see that there's always all five of the different colors there. So there's some interesting work behind the scenes to make all that happen. How can I make all those things happen at once? Um, it has to do with the underlying pattern there that I chose uh, for making this sculpture. Uh, this was a commission for a library. Uh, this was actually in 1999, at the turn of the century. Um, they wanted a big sculpture, so what I proposed was that they set up a voting booth, and everyone who comes to the library could write in their three favorite votes of the century, of whatever the three favorite books are, and the librarians totaled them, and then I used a computer-controlled router to carve the titles and authors in these wooden things that look like books, but they're actually hollow. Uh, and along the spine of each book, there's a steel rod, and I brought all these pieces to the library, and I had a foundry cast those little donuts, so they're made of bronze, and I drilled holes for the steel rods to go in, and little holes for screws. So I had like an instant sculpture kit, and I brought this thing there, and I, we put up signs, you know, come to the sculpture barn raising, and 100 people came, and I had no idea, is this going to take an hour, is this going to take all day, is something terrible going to happen? But it took about two hours to build, and nothing terrible happened. You know, I had all these worries, someone's going to steal a book, or some book's going to break, whatever. Uh, but it slides together with a very interesting, complex uh, sequence to get everything there. Um, so each of the donuts has holes in it for the steel rod. Each book has a steel rod. Imagine you built everything and had one last book to go. You couldn't stick the book in at both ends because the rod, the, everything else would already be in place. It's sort of like the problem of putting the toilet paper holder in the wall. So in the toilet paper holder, you can kind of squeeze it. It has like one it has a rod that squeezes it, goes in, and then expands. Uh, I wasn't that fancy, so instead, uh, I designed it where all the edges are parallel. This is a particular type of shape called a zonohedron. A zonohedron is a class of polyhedra forms where all the edges come in parallel families. So you can cut this in half, 
and one half connects to the other half with 10 rods that are parallel, so they can all join at once. And then each of those halves can be built in two halves that join together, again, because it's parallel. So the whole thing can be sort of divided in half and half and half and half. Just have to mentally play that backwards to put this together with 100 people at the library and then <laughs> two hours. And uh, the number one book of the library, uh, I think it's not in this picture, but it was The Catcher in the Rye. That was a, a, the top voting book. And there's, there's a pattern to how the numbers go around in the six different types of wood that are there, et cetera. So I like to do these things I call sculpture bar maidens, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures. Um, in any case, so I have a lot of sculptures here, and I'm not going to tell you about all of them because it would take a long time. Uh, but they each have a, an interesting story. Um, this one I'll just say a word about. This is about a meter in diameter. Uh, this is at a university in Spain. It's 180 pieces. They're laser cut wood. And uh, the thing that's hard to believe or to understand is that each of those pieces, wherever two pieces join, uh, there's what a carpenter calls a mortise and tenon joint. That means that there's a hole in one, there's the end of the other that kind of sticks out and it goes through a slot, and then there's a hole for a pin that goes in, a little wooden pin and wedges in there and locks it together. Um, I laser cut all those pieces, and the laser cuts perpendicular to the surface, orthogonal, at right angles to the surface. That means wherever two, point, two pieces join, they join at right angles. So everything you're seeing there, wherever the pieces join, it's a 90 degree angle. And it looks like, how can those be 90 degree angles? I see all these crazy curves and stuff. Um, but in fact, I started from that constraint. Knowing that the laser cutter cuts at right angles, I said to myself, well, I could make like a cube that would have right angles, or I could make something with more right angles. And then I sort of challenged myself, what's the most complex, interesting thing I can make that only uses right angles uh, until I came to this with an enormous number of right angles in there. So it's completely regular. There's all these curves, but the joints are all at 90 degrees. Uh, so that was actually my prototype, a wooden uh, one, a meter in diameter, before making a larger scale version of it. This is two meters in diameter. Uh, this is at Stony Brook University in the Computer Science Building. And again, it uses the same technique, slightly different proportions, because the, the metal is stronger than wood. It can be thinner. Uh, but again, it joins together with uh, more than 10 joints and uh, little cotter pins as the uh, pins. Um, here's a kind of a sculpture that doesn't have any nuts and bolts or glue or whatever. Uh, so what I was doing here is challenging myself to come up with a shape that locks together. And you have to kind of bend the, little, the last one a little bit, kind of spring it into place. But once it's in there, it all pushes against each other. Uh, so there's 20 pieces of the shape you see on the right. And it's very carefully calculated so that they rest against each other. And uh, it's completely self-contained. I mean, it's not glued or welded or raised or anything. I think if you took out one piece, it would just go shooting across the room. Uh, and I had to use like a big wooden lever, this big long, to get that last piece in there to kind of bend it to snap it into place. But then it's incredibly uh, very solid. So it's uh, just steel, uh, powder coated red. And you can see the little notches, there's six notches in the shape on the right, where each one connects to six other pieces, and that's what holds it together. So the last one is what locked it together. Until that last one was in, it would just fall apart. How big is that one? Um, it's only about this big, maybe seven or eight inches. And I should mention the construction that we're going to do today, that you're going to do, those of you who say after, we're going to make a structure out of playing cards, which has the same property that it all falls apart until the last one gets to, uh, in, goes together. So maybe a little frustrating to get that last piece. Uh, but this is sort of the thing that I've, I've gotten used to, and I, I think I can get you uh, used to it as well. Uh, so here's just sort of a similar idea, but a much more complex piece. But again, the very last piece has to kind of snap into place to lock this together, but it's a much more complex kind of interlocking. Um, this was a uh, retirement present for a friend of mine, a professor, a math professor who uh, retired, and uh, he likes puzzles, so I designed a puzzle for him. There's 30 separate pieces, and they all hook together in this complex way, um, and they look like a, a long bar with a head on each end, one facing up and one facing down. And in the back of the head, there's a kind of a notch and the notch is all locked together, and in the neck there's a kind of a notch, and getting this all together and getting that last piece in is the, uh, the assembly trick for this puzzle. It's about this big. Oh, I should mention, I have uh, kind of model of that one. I don't know if you can see this at all, but uh, sometimes when I make a sculpture, I'd like to have it forever, I'd like to keep it, but there's a lot of work to make, I'm only making one, one of a kind. Uh, so the actual one that I made, is gone, I, uh, you know, given away as present. 
but I made for myself a little model that I can keep to kind of remind me of it. So this is made on a 3D printer, and I'll show you a bunch more things made on a 3D printer. Um, I think this is another sculpture I, I showed a picture of earlier, but I didn't talk about it. But again, it's my own model of it with the actual sculpture. Uh, just somewhere else. Uh, this I did as a barn raising, oh, maybe about five years ago. I was artist in resident at uh, MIT and used a laser cutter there to cut out these pieces and then had a whole group of people help me put together this one sculpture. Um, this is a wooden sculpture, less than two feet long, about 18 inches. Uh, which I did first before building uh, a much larger version. So this is about four feet diameter. Uh, and then I made an even larger metal version. Um, so one idea that you can do is kind of fun is to make things out of paper. So what you see here is 12 copies of that shape on the left. So if you can cut out that shape very carefully and interweave it, the parts have this very complex kind of interdigitation, how the fingers go through each other. Um, it's a puzzle for me to build, and then uh, you probably can't see unless you're sitting in the very front, but at the ends of all of those fingers, there's little slots, and the little slots just slide together. And I can just barely see it from here. Um, so the whole thing just goes together by weaving this all together, sliding the slots, and then it all locks in place. And again, the, the fingers and the spaces are carefully calculated ahead of time so that they don't bump into each other, so that when I do assemble it, everything just barely passes uh, the other pieces. Okay, that's the kind of challenge that I like for myself. I design these things, and then I have to figure out some way to build it. Uh, same idea, but more pieces, more complex. So two of those pieces that look like a three overlap one upside down to make this eight shape. And then again, there's little notches, which you may not be able to see on the screen there, at the ends of those tabs. And the, the notches just slide together, and the paper friction holds it from falling apart. Um, so it took me about a half a day to figure out how I might make it, and then another half a day to actually build it once I had the strategy that works, getting all those pieces. Uh, before they're all there, you know, to get it all look kind of logical and organized, and it is, but before it's all there, when it's half done, everything is falling apart, and you don't know there's a piece going in front or behind another piece, and you have everything off there. So um, I enjoy that kind of challenge. Uh, this, on the other hand, is a much simpler thing to make. Uh, this is a kind of a topological surface. So I think last week's talk was about topology. Some of you were here may have learned something about surfaces and edges. Uh, this is one continuous surface. It has just one side, and it has six edges, and it makes an interesting kind of pattern. And I like this idea, so I wanted to make it real. Uh, it's actually made of wire. I took uh, wire to build this whole shape, and then I coated it with paper mache and painted it white. So it's paper mache built over a wire framework that gave me the geometry. A uh, similar idea, more complex, made of uh, acrylic plastic or uh, plexiglass. So each of those pieces of plastic has a twist in it. I had to heat it in an oven to soften it uh, to get the plastic soft, and then put the twist I want and put it in a jig that held it exactly at the right uh, angle that I want. Let it cool down, and then I had the pieces, and then I had to assemble the pieces, uh, glue them together. And uh, this plastic is very rigid; it doesn't it's not like rubber; it doesn't flex. So everything had to be exactly right. It wasn't, if there was a little gap, there would be the glue would be there. Uh, so it had to be very carefully worked out to get all these pieces uh, very precisely made and assembled. More pieces are uh, made of acrylic plastic. Um, I won't talk about all these. Um, again, there's something about the math I like, something about the, uh, the assembly that was probably a challenge uh, to build. Um, so this is made of uh, 3D printing. So what you have here is a big shape, a uh, mathematician would call it an icosahedron, and each icosahedron is made of smaller icosahedron, each of those is made of a smaller shape, it's kind of a fractal shape, uh, and it's got many, many pieces that just barely touch each other to connect. Uh, there's no way I could build this by hand, if I had to carve this out of you know, soap or wood or butter or metal or whatever, um, it's just too complex to do that. Um, there's no way I can make little pieces and glue them together. They wouldn't stick at just the point. The only technology that can make this is what's called a 3D printer. So all these things I have here are made on 3D printers. Uh, a 3D printer is a machine uh, that I can design a shape on the computer. I can basically hit the print button, and the machine builds it. And the way it works is I design the shape. I think of what I want solid and what I want air. And the computer can calculate for each cross section, let's z equal 0, 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, every, say, thousandth of an inch, what the cross section of my shape looks like, and print that cross section using material a thousandth of an inch thick, and then stack all those cross sections. Uh, so this is made of nylon on a very fancy 3D printer. 
at Stony Brook University that cost about a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, and each of these layers is built on top of the other by working in a powdered nylon. Powdered so you have a bucket of powdered nylon, very fine powder. A computer-controlled laser draws on it with hot enough to melt it, but it only draws the part you want solid. Uh, then that cross-section is melted and it fuses together. The rest of your powder is still powder. And it's sitting in a piston that goes down a thousandth of an inch. A little supply chamber comes up, brings more powder, a little squeegee roller flattens it out, and then the laser melts the second cross-section, and that melts to the one below it. And it keeps doing this, melt, go down, add more, melt more, until you build up all these layers. And the loose powder you vacuum away at the end. And what's left with them fused together is your object. Uh, it's expensive, it's fancy, it uses the much more complex than I said, there's like a big chilling system and heaters and liquid nitrogen, etc., so the nylon doesn't burn. Uh, but in the end, uh, you can make anything you can think of. So whatever you can think of, if you can describe it to the computer, this machine can build it. Uh, as long as nothing is smaller than about a thousand of it. Um, so I have a number of models here that are made on that machine, uh, and this is one of them. They enable me to take very complex ideas and uh, bring them out. So here's one of a series of objects that's based on what are called hyperbolic tessellations. So mathematicians study all different kinds of spaces. Uh, one kind of space is called a hyperbolic space. In hyperbolic space, um, in some sense, there's, it's a different set of rules than our space, but they're consistent rules. So if you look at the ceiling, you'll see here at each point, you can put four squares around. Okay? So you can put four squares around a point that exactly fit in our ordinary space. In hyperbolic space, you can change the rules, and maybe you can put, say, five squares around this point, or six or more. There's a lot more room in hyperbolic space, and you can do more things. Um, so I took some ideas, what are called uniform tessellations. Uh, so at each little vertex there, where, where things meet, they meet the same way, and it's a very regular pattern if you look at it carefully. And they're all equal size holes that fit together in a uniform, regular way in hyperbolic space. But that can't live in our space. So I had to kind of transform it. There's ways that mathematicians sort of take patterns in other spaces and distort them as little as possible. Here I use something called the Poincaré disk as a way to transform that idea to this space and then turn that into a sculpture um, that sort of shows something about the patterns I was interested in. And also I tried to create kind of an undersea, underwater feeling that this is something that you might find swimming around in the ocean. Uh, and as part of a series, uh, that again take these what are called uniform tessellations in the hyperbolic plane and transform them into sculptures. Um, so here perhaps you can see the idea if I, if I use my mouse. Um, if I look at any one corner, say here, I have a square, one with four sides, and then I have one with five sides, and then I have one with four sides, and I have one with five sides. In fact, in every vertex, everywhere uh, four things meet, there's square, pentagon, square, pentagon. And they're all regular, and all the pentagons are equal, all the squares are equal in hyperbolic space. But we can't do that in our space, so I have to kind of distort it that changes the, uh, the proportion in some sense, and those littler pieces as you get to the edges. Um, but it illustrates this pattern that I was interested in. So we can only fit four squares. We couldn't put pentagons. It would have too many angles, uh, too many degrees in our space, but we can do that in hyperbolic space. Uh, this is also made on a 3D printer. Uh, I won't say anything about this, except it's actually, it, it was buried in a time capsule about five years ago. It's going to be dug up in 45 more years, um, sort of representing the state of, of uh, art and technology. Um, I'm curious to see if people in 50 years uh, like it or not. Uh, so I'll show you a couple of pictures of, these are all about eight inches. These were centerpieces for a fancy mathematical dinner. And they have interesting uh, colors. And these are built on a color 3D printer. So there are 3D printers that not only make the shape I want, but can assign color to every point. And so I can use mathematical algorithms to decide how I want them colored, and the machine builds them. Um, as I said, these are about eight inches. Uh, here again, I was trying to get sort of an undersea look, but each of these has sort of a, a different uh, idea that I was trying to create. And uh, one more 3D printed object. So this shows you what you can do with this technology. Uh, this is a ball about eight inches in diameter. Uh, it's made of thousands of little links, like uh, chain mail. Uh, but I didn't link them together. It was built linked. So what you see here, each of those pieces were built in these layers in the form that you see it. Uh, and then when you remove the powder, what you have is basically like a fabric that things can move. Uh, the overall shape has uh, 
12 of these soft spots. Uh, get the next picture. Oh, this is a close-up to show you what the links look like. Um, and so this machine can make very tiny little pieces if you tell it all the little pieces you want. Uh, so on the right, you can see what holds it together. Why doesn't this thing just fall flat? Like if you had a bag of chain on the table, it would just lie flat. Uh, what I did for the blue section is I made the pieces a little fatter so that they lock into each other and they, they aren't flexible chain. They're, they're glued together like they become one long rod. Uh, but for the, in the section that's colored red, I made just enough space so that the chain is free to move. So the blue part is kind of a scaffold that holds the overall shape, and the red parts are flexible. If you shake it around, they move like cloth. Uh, and what's interesting is that no matter how you hold it, uh, the top six parts, if there's 12 of these pentagon openings, uh, soft spots, the, the top six kind of sag down, and the bottom six also sag down. Gravity makes it sag down. So the bottom half looks round, and the top half you see these dimples. And when you turn it different ways, it always looks like that. Um, here's a sculpture I did. This is a university in Michigan. Uh, they had this big space. They built a big science center, and they said, you know, can I design a big sculpture for it? And it was too big for me to make a big sculpture. I said, I can't make a sculpture that big. How about a bunch of little sculptures? And they said, OK. Uh, so these are each four feet in diameter, and there's nine of them that span this uh, room, which is about 120 feet long. Uh, and they start at the far end with the yellow, and each one, as you come along closer, they get a little more orange, more orange, until you come to the one that's near the camera here, uh, which is red. Um, and they actually each have two colors, and each one is a slightly different change from the one behind it. So the very far one, uh, that's small here, the yellow one, that's made of what's called an icosahedron and a dodecahedron, the two well-known shapes that mathematicians study. Um, and they're both together there. They kind of go through each other in a nice way. Slightly curved, but if you look at it, you'll see very clearly, you'll recognize an icosahedron and a dodecahedron. Um, but for the next shape, I kind of bent the edges a little bit. I distorted it a little bit. And then for the next shape, I bent them more, and I had a piece that was in front, now comes around back behind the other. And then as you come further, there's like a hole in the pieces. And as you get further along, there's a little change, a little change, a little change, until you get to the piece that's closest to the camera here. And it's a very complex, exploding, flower-like thing. And it's not at all obvious that where it comes from, uh, unless you look at the whole sequence. Uh, so to me, uh, this is somehow a kind of, a, I'd say, like a metaphor for what a mathematician does when they create a proof. So the idea of a proof uh, is that a mathematician starts with known simple things that everyone likes and agrees. I say, I, I believe those facts. And then combines them and goes a little change, little change, and you build up a sequence of steps until you end up with something new and surprising. Uh, and this is sort of illustrating the idea of a proof, the idea of a derivation of a little change at a time, starting from something known until you end up with something kind of wonderful and fun um, in a visual, sculptural way. Uh, so this I did as a barn raising. I have some pictures here of putting it together. Uh, so there's a close-up. Uh, so what I did is I designed these nine different boards. They each have now it's uh, 180 of these big pieces you see, and then a couple of hundred little brackets and lots of nuts and bolts. Altogether, there's over 18,000 pieces in this overall thing. I wasn't going to put together 18,000 pieces. I put up a sign, come to the barn raising. So everyone would come help me put together these things. So um, the whole campus came and helped me assemble these over uh, about four hours one morning. Uh, and here you can see some of the steps of put, taking these pieces in brackets and screwing them together. Um, and each one is different, so I had to run around from table to table, uh, sort of helping people with a particular shape of, of, that they were building, uh, which were all slightly different, before we hung them up. And that's the final result. Um, so I have a little video of that. I'm going to interrupt this part of the talk and switch to some videos uh, and show you this. Uh, so this is a time lapse of building it over the period of, uh, you'll see in one minute, well, it was actually about four hours of uh, putting all these parts together. And so there's an inner layer, and then there's like an outer layer. There's two different shapes of the big pieces, and two slightly different colors. And it's like instant sculpture. You can see there's already chains hanging out from the ceiling. I worked out where I wanted them to come. I had the building people put these chains. So then they came in with a lift, and they can lift them all up get each one up into place. <laughs> Instant sculpture.
that's at uh, Albion College in Michigan, if you're ever in the Detroit area. Check that out. Um, so now I'll show you a different sculpture that I did as a bone This is a 3D printed model. I showed you this color 3D printed. This is a model about 10 inches across uh, that I did before building the sculpture just so I could look at it and see that I liked it. It's all made of triangles. About half the triangles are flat and half of them have a little bend in them. All carefully worked out to fit together to make the shape. Um, and I had a laser cutting company cut out the metal pieces and I brought them all. Uh, this was actually done on the mall in Washington, D.C., outside the Smithsonian about two years ago. And uh, you can see the part there. And just have anyone who wanted to come to this table to help me put it together. And there's a very complex plan for which pieces of which colors, uh, four different colors, uh, whether the bench and I go together in one arrangement. But uh, this worked out in about two and a half days, uh, getting all these pieces assembled. Uh, building larger and larger modules uh, that kind of went together until uh, there's the final sculpture. Uh, it's called gyrangle because it's, it's based on a uh, surface mathematicians call it gyroid surface, which is a, a very wiggly, fun thing. And I figured out a way to make it out of triangles, which I thought was cool, uh, which is the, the basis for the sculpture. Okay, that was used actually as a, the logo for a conference. Uh, so if you like this sort of thing, if you like math and art a lot, uh, there's conferences, and in, in every field there are conferences where professionals come together and sort of show their new ideas and talk to other experts and uh, sort of get a creativity recharge of what's going on. Anyway, so there's this field of math and art, this Bridges conference, uh, which uh, was a couple months ago. It's one every year. It was uh, at Towson University. I uh, happened to use my sculpture because it's at Towson University. Um, and I should just mention there's also a journal. So if you're a professional and you want to, if you're an academic and you want to publish papers about your research in this area, uh, there's a place called the Journal of Mathematics and Art for that. Uh, people often ask me, can I make a kit, something that they can build these sculptures themselves? So I did make this kit. Uh, this is a sculpture I make called Fragis. This is a one of a kind here. Um, and, uh, but for people to make their own version of it, I designed this plastic kit, and uh, you can buy this. It's, uh, you look online for Fragis, and it's sold to the Museum of Mathematics, and uh, there's a fancy version with lots of colors as well. And let me say just a bit about the Museum of Mathematics. Uh, so mathematics is such a cool thing that it needs a fun museum. And uh, not too far from here in New York City, there is a Museum of Mathematics, which I've been working on for the last four years, uh, which is going to open uh, this December in about one more month. So basically, it's on 11 East 26th Street. Um, it's going to be full of hands-on, interactive, cool things that uh, are fun to do, like you've seen in science museums, but where the idea is to learn something fun about math while uh, doing something exciting. Here's the kind of thing that's kind of cool. Here's a tricycle where the wheels are square. Um, even though the wheels are square, you get a perfectly smooth ride. How is that possible? Well, the floor compensates for the squares. If you solve the right equation, uh, you can discover that the floor has to be what's called the catenary curve. The catenary is the curve that you get if you hold a piece of chain and let the chain hang down and makes a shape. It looks something like a parabola. It's a little bit different. Um, but if you turn that upside down to make a kind of a bump, and you have a series of those, the corners of the wheels go through the, into the bumps, and uh, the axle, the center of the square, stays at a constant height, and the triangle, uh, the, the tricycle, rides on the axle so you have a smooth ride. And so we made a round one with two of these. One goes clockwise, one goes counterclockwise. Um, I like to design activities. This is a kind of a hands-on building thing uh, made out of pieces that, that screw together uh, that can also be uh, also associated with museums. And um, let me just quickly show you a series of things that I've written up of fun math things you can do at home. Okay. Um, so there's a series uh, called Math Mondays that I wrote for um, Make Magazine. If you just Google Math Mondays, you'll find a whole list of these. Uh, here's some instructions on how to take a bagel and cut it into two pieces that are equal and that are each a closed loop, but instead of coming apart as you normally slice a bagel, they're linked together like a chain. Uh, and there it is. <laughs> so your homework assignment for tomorrow is to get some bagels for breakfast and cut them in this way that they're linked together. And the instructions, if you just Google uh, linked bagels, you'll find it. Uh, here's a kind of a construction kit, a laser cut pieces that uh, connect together to make a big thing. Uh, this I believe you'll be able to play with at the Museum of Mathematics. Um, this is an activity actually designed by my daughter. My daughter, by heart, uh, also likes all the same things I like, cool math things, and she has a series of videos. If you Google her, you may find some things. Um, she learned how to make 
uh, balloons into uh, you know dogs and poodles or whatever, and said, well, why don't we also make tetrahedra and octahedra? So uh, she created some geometric things out of balloons. You can Google that. Those, those are fun. Um, I decided to make something else with a balloon. This is like a ship in a bottle, but this is an octahedron inside a balloon. And it's an interesting question. How would you make an octahedron inside a balloon? Anyway, not that easy, but uh, if you Google my book page, you'll, you'll find a solution as to how to do that. <laughs> very carefully. Yeah, the, it's actually very, very easy. I'll tell you. What you do is you start with the balloon inside out, and you mark the parts on the outside, and you glue with rubber cement the strips wherever you want them to go inside out. And then you turn it the other way around, you blow it up, and you have your thing inside the balloon. <coughs> it's much easier than a ship in a bottle because the balloon can be turned inside out. Um, here's just a fun thing you can make with light sticks. Um, these glow in the dark and they help together with rubber bands to make a giant structure. Uh, this is a CD thing that you can put together with uh, sort of cable ties to make, uh, you might recognize the truncated icosahedron again, the Buffy ball, the soccer ball uh, in this form. Uh, here's a hyperboloid. I keep forgetting to hold things up for you, but um, here's a hyperboloid shape. It's made of straight lines, and there's a way that you can make it out of uh, skewers and little uh, ponytail type rubber bands that hold everything together. And it's flexible. It squeezes and opens, and it's all made of uh, two families of straight lines. And here's what you get if you want to make it really large. It's taking two plywood circles, a lot of string, big enough to stand inside it. Uh, this is a toy that you may have seen outside of one of the tables called Zone Tool. Zone Tool was designed by an architect for making domes, but it turns out to be really good for making lots of other things. Uh, what you're seeing here is a three-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional object. So just as we study geometry in three dimensions, you can step back and think in higher dimensions, or four dimensions. Uh, if you're interested in that, there's a great book called Flatland you might want to read about four-dimensional space. Uh, this is a very interesting, beautiful thing in four dimensions that we take its shadow as a three-dimensional object, and I built it with, I forget, about five or 6,000 pieces of zone tool using 50 people to help me uh, out in Central Park in New York City one day. So a lot of people came, we built this thing, we left it out there, and everyone who was walking through the park would come and see this and say, what is that? And we'd say, well, it's a three-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional object. <laughs> and both 600 tell. Uh, and they'd say, what? And they say, well, don't you do this back in France or back in New York City, wherever you come from? Anyway, so it's a kind of a fun thing, and then we took it all apart. So it was just a, a one day sculpture. Um, so I mentioned some 3D printers that can make fancy things. There's also little 3D printers that you can use at home. There's many different companies all around the world that are designing these. Um, this is one called the MakerBot, uh, which is about this big, and it, can, it melts plastic. It takes kind of a fishing line in there, and it melts it, and then it uses motors to squirt out that liquid plastic to kind of build up, as if you had like a, a hot melt a glue gun that you were squirting, like using a robot to, to build up with it. And quite a few of these objects here are made on that machine, um, and it looks like that. And I'll just show you a couple pictures of things. So that's the first thing I built it when I got this, a little tetrahedron. Uh, it is a tetrahedron with some extra stuff, but that's what it looks like after you clean it up was adjusting everything. I like to design puzzles. Uh, so that's a puzzle made of 12 sticks. I have some other stick puzzles here, but they, they interlock. Uh, the pieces are loose until you snap them together, and then uh, they hold together. Uh, that's what I was just showing you. Uh, this, oh, I think I forgot to bring this. Oh, no, I think it's in my bag. Anyway, I will show you this um, sometime. But it's made of two parts that snap together, and you can hold it different ways. It's kind of fun. Yeah, this is definitely in my bag. This is a, a classic puzzle. Uh, the puzzle is to think of what shape would fit snugly through a square, through a triangle, and through a circle. And it's kind of an interesting challenge. Is there a three-dimensional shape that would exactly snugly fit through? And the answer is a kind of a wedge you see on the right. It has a circle on the bottom, and it comes up on two sides, and it's a square for one part. And you can slide it through and have it exactly fit through each of those different uh, holes. And that's a, that's a puzzle I first learned as a kid from a Martin Gardner book. And if you're interested in uh, sort of learning about mathematics in different ways, uh, I strongly recommend uh, look up books by Martin Gardner. They're, they're written to show you sort of the fun side of mathematics in, in all different aspects, including puzzles. Uh, this is a light dimmer now. Uh, so what happened was I was at home one day, and somehow one of my little nephews or somebody 
uh, lost the light dimmer knob off the wall, and I said, oh gosh, I guess I'll go to the hardware store and buy a light dimmer knob. And I'm standing right next to my 3D printer, and then I go like, duh, why don't I just make the light dimmer knob? I have a 3D printer. So what would be a cool light dimmer knob? Well, obviously one based on a hyperbolic tessellation. Um, so this I took one of those tessellations from the hyperbolic plane and wrapped it around a hemisphere to make a kind of a knob and built it. And as long as I designed a quarter inch hole on the back that slides over the knob, it works fine. But the really cool thing is, after I made it, I took a picture, I put it on my website, and then uh, once you have these 3D models, you can download from the internet. So like the next day, I'm getting email from the Netherlands and from New Zealand. People said, cool light dimmer knob, I made one too. So like when you design something, the, the whole the idea is that your designs can be spread around the world by people who like them. Okay, so let me wrap up now. Um, I'm going to show you, I think, a video or two, but let me first say, I filled some things out of cards, and what we're going to do at the end of my talk uh, is a card construction. Uh, these are some card constructions. One is made of 30 cards, and one is made of 60 cards that have slots in them, and they slide together. Uh, this is not the construction we're going to do today, though they're, they're fine, fun constructions. You can look them up on uh, my website. Uh, this is one made of 30 cards. I call the Do Deck Get it? Um, And that also is on my website. Uh, but that would take about two hours to build. Uh, so instead, we're going to make this one. Um, this one has 12 cards, and uh, it's still complex enough that it may take almost an hour to build. Uh, let me point out something about the symmetry while I have this picture here on the screen. Uh, many of my sculptures use the idea of symmetry. So what do I mean by something that's symmetric? Uh, something is symmetric uh, when there's something I can do to it that makes it look the same. Uh, so a person is symmetric if you could reflect that person in the mirror and they look the same. If your left side is the same as your right side, then you're symmetric to the extent that reflecting you leaves you unchanged. Um, an object with rotational symmetry, if I can pull something here like this, if you look straight down at this object, uh, this has, what, 11 sticks. So if I turn this 11th of a turn, or two 11ths of a turn, it looks the same. Like if you closed your eyes and I turned it or I didn't turn it, you wouldn't know if I turned it or not. The idea that I can turn it, do this transformation, and it looks the same is what symmetry is about for mathematician. Um, so this sculpture has a three-way symmetry and a four-way symmetry and a two-way symmetry. So as it goes around, um, you can see one spot where three cards come together in a spiral, and there is a spot where four cards come together in a spiral. Understanding the symmetry is key to building the sculpture, so that once you figure out how a little bit of it goes together, Everything else is the same, just you're building three-way cycles and four-way cycles. Um, I just wanted to mention that while I have that slide there. Um, so let me show you maybe a little video. Oh, we have sand. Um, so this is a construction where I designed a shape, and I brought it to a, a school, and I said, why don't we cut out these pieces and build this really big, and I have no idea if this is going to work, if it's going to explode, if it's going to hold together. I mean, you could do a structural analysis if this was made out of steel and figure out is it strong enough to withstand the wind and load and this and that. But basically, I just said, we're just going to build it and hope that it fits together. But maybe it's going to collapse at the end. I don't know. Um, so I designed this template, and I brought the pieces over um, uh, to the university. And uh, we ordered some cardboard, and I brought a little saw so we can cut out the pieces. And that's the template, so what you're seeing is one cardboard master that I had made at home, uh, claiming that that shape, which has six slots, will exactly fit together with itself in this complex way. And so we traced it, and as you can see there, that's actually a stack of five pieces on top of each other. So we took five pieces of cardboard and held them together with these black binder clips and traced the template on top um, and started cutting out these pieces. And I didn't really know that it would fit together. I just sort of hoped. <laughs> anyway, it started to fit together. That's good. So these pieces join together first as a cycle of three that make it kind of a three-way module. And then the, each module has to join to the next module and the next module. And there's sort of three levels of joints. And a lot of pieces, 60 pieces, so we spent a lot of time cutting and cutting and cutting. I just made this video about three days ago. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was very easy to get things 
backwards and look around, so we have to kind of be careful for that. You can see in the right that yellow paper model. So I kind of knew that in paper it would work, but the paper is much more flexible. Than the I want to get a half dozen or so different designs of this flavor, the templates online. Um, I haven't yet uh, finished writing the web page for this, but so that other people can then take this template and do this at their school. This could be a math club activity or whatever. Um, and with the video of instructions as to how the parts go together. It's a little bit of tape going on there, and this is only go to have to cheat a little be honest and show you that. Uh, in some places we ripped it. We probably could have cut it some extras, but uh, we just wanted to get together. But there, there were some parts where the things didn't quite like fit, and we had, to, we had to stop and think a little bit. And it took a long time. It took three hours, so. See in the end and say, oh, I, that's easy, but uh, things take much more time than you realize. This is the next to the last piece. But still, you can kind of slip it in. And then we had a puzzle with the very last piece. Okay? The, last, the last module couldn't fit in through the hole to get behind where it had to be. So we had to, we had to stop and think a little bit. How do we get that last module in when it's bigger than the hole? So we had to come back with a plan. And the plan was to take the three separate pieces and put them inside individually and build the module inside.